Our next speaker this morning has impressed our institute audiences with the depth and breadth of her knowledge and clinical skills. Dr. E. Reed Felsen is a clinical psychologist specializing in the treatment of trauma and traumatic loss and has published and lectured widely, widely in the U.S., Canada, Israel, and Europe. She served as research consultant to Yale University's Holocaust Trauma Project and has recently conducted research on trauma survivors at the Swiss Center for Neuroaffective Science at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. In addition, Dr. Felsen has served as clinical psychologist in inpatient adolescent psychiatry at Yale University's Psychiatric Institute. Dr. Felsen maintains a private practice in New Jersey working with adolescents, adults, and families. She serves on an emergency response team for the delivery of clinical services following critical incidents and provides on-site trauma intervention for employee assistance programs. We appreciate her sharing her knowledge and expertise with us and uh, her private practice and uh, her home are in New Jersey, so you know that she made a special effort to come be with us today given the weather. It's my honor to introduce to you Dr. E. Reed Felsen. Good morning. Thank you very much, Arlene. That was really uh, very, very uh, kind of you. It is a, a special honor to be invited uh, again and again, and I hope I will uh, deserve it. I wanted to say just one thing uh, before I start. Research shows, research that was conducted in Canada about, uh, you know, Aborigine communities, re research in many, many different communities has shown that the um, ability of offenders to benefit from treatment is uh, better when leaders in the community are perceived as endorsing treatment. And so it is of particular value that the community is addressing it, that the doors are taken uh, off the hinges and opened, and that uh, such prominent figures are standing here today speaking about this topic. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, that um, I wanted to address a little bit the, the, the cultural context of what we're talking about, because sexuality and physicality and, and the uh, physical aspects of interpersonal uh, uh, relationships are such a cultural dependent um, construct. I wanted to address that a little bit, and I wanted to start by saying that we all forget, especially when we stay within our own natural environment, how much so it is. For me, oh, I'm sorry. Is this good? For me, as I mentioned to Arlene in one of our many conversations, um, uh, for me, a very shocking moment that I will never forget happened when I first left Israel. I was uh, quite young. And I went to uh, North Germany, Hamburg. I was working for the Israeli government there for a few years. And in the very, very beginning, uh, I had never lived abroad before. I came from, you know, my own circle in Israel and uh, was used to the way we do it there. And I met at the university where I was also studying at the time a very nice uh, a woman, not Jewish. Uh, we befriended each other, and we started um, doing all kinds of things together. I went to play squash with her in a very nice neighborhood club. So we played squash, and after that she said, you know, why don't we go into the swimming pool? Uh, and the sauna and the swimming pool, uh, that are part of the club. And I said, fine. So I, you know, took a little bit longer. She left. She said she'll meet me there. I take a shower after playing squash. I walk out into the uh, sauna with my uh, fairly reasonably decent uh, bathing suit, and I open the door, and I freeze because the sauna is filled with mixed male and female people. They're completely nude. They're very comfortable sitting spread around, having conversation, I'm the only one in a bathing suit, they're looking at me as if I'm the alien. And for me, it was a shocking experience of how, it was, by the way, completely asexual. The whole idea in North Germany, which is, by the way, a society in which, if anything, flirting and sexual innuendo is very, very suppressed. Um, 
but it's the, the nudity is a part of a naturalistic sort of body hygiene view. It was completely not a sexual setting. It had no sexual feeling to it. Yet, uh, the, the fact that what is appropriate and acceptable in one place can be so different from what is appropriate and acceptable in another place was very much burnt into my brain at that moment. So, um, you know, sometimes, uh, again, just to say that, sometimes a picture speaks uh, volumes much more than words, but here is a photograph that I did not, take, de did not dare to take and would not dare to show, but last summer, again, about the same issue of how different things are in different places and how cultural uh, dependent they are. Last summer when I was in Switzerland again, I had friends visit me and we went to this very beautiful little place near Geneva called Annecy where there's a beautiful lake. It was a hot summer day. We walked around and afterwards we went to the beach on the lake on Sunday. And it was fairly busy. It's a beautiful little lake, beautiful little beach. It was fairly crowded. And here are the blue mountains and the blue water. And right next to me, had I had the nerve, I could have taken this picture. A meter away from me were two not at all young local women bathing, you know, with their tops completely off and, you know, lying and speaking and, and, and treating it very naturally. And right next to them, a woman in a dark black barca, not like we see them in New York with a, just a headdress, but in Geneva you see them now with the full facial cover and the very thin slits just for the eyes, and they were sitting, you know, 50 centimeters from each other. That's culture, and that's what our world is like today if we, uh, if we are not uh, living in a very insular uh, way within our own community, which has become more and more difficult to do, also because of the Internet and the ways in which uh, society at large comes into different communities, even if we don't go out to other places. So to speak a little bit of the uh, uh, cultural and social context of our views of sexualities, um, I would like to start with a very brief review of what we all kind of take for granted today. The fact that we even speak about children's sexuality is only about uh, an idea that's only about 100 years old uh, uh, if we, if we uh, look at, uh, at the um, revolutionary concepts that Freud brought about. Early sexologists in the 19th uh, sex century did deal with sexuality, with human sexuality, but primarily they dealt with deviant um, uh, aspects of it. They dealt primarily with homosexuality, masturbation, and the perversions, and in terms of normal sexuality, the main focus was on adult reproductive sexuality. Uh, in the 19th century, the view of most sexologists, which prominent sexologists, which were primarily actually in the German-speaking countries, was that um, uh, homosexuality, the, the main focus of, of those uh, uh, writings, was a, a perverse, uh, degenerative, failure, and uh, later on it was sort of modified uh, from uh, it's, no longer, it's no longer seen as criminally insane in the later phase of, that, uh, of those writings, but uh, uh, due to an embryonic, a failure in embryonic differentiation that leaves the individual sort of uh, in, the, in the undifferentiated state of the fetal bisexuality. It's due to a genetic failure, as I said, and so there was a certain move from a moral, legal view of it to a more medical uh, view of it, medical formulation, and uh, at the same time, masturbation stay, uh, remained viewed more negatively, primarily as uh, something that is very unhealthy and leads to depletion of uh, mental capacities and uh, even insanity. By the way, um, it was fairly extensively documented with various examples, clinical examples, which were pretty satisfactory in the uh, eyes of the, uh, of the uh, pr 
present time professionals, which is always a, a comment to remember in every context that we deal with as mental health professionals, I think we have to remember that our profession is not immune to biases and to our own uh, use of our uh, data to support our um, a priori uh, beliefs. Uh, at the turn of the century, we see a broader interest in normal sexuality, which was actually brought about by the uh, research and interest in the study of perversions. Because what happened was that while before sexuality was narrowly looked at normal sexuality as adult reproductive sexuality, uh, looking at the perversions, one had to come to the conclusion that obviously there are some aspects of sexuality that do not have something to do directly with reproduction and with the reproductive organs, but with other pleasures that come from other parts of the body and for other aims. So um, with that uh, came about the uh, discussion of erotic zones and other um, aspects of uh, human sexuality. And uh, that's where Freud came in and with his study of the perversions, uh, discovering that uh, infantile um, sexuality had many, many other aspects than, um, than those related to the reproductive organs or the genital organs. He uh, related to the other pleasures uh, related to other body parts as pregenital, including the anal and the, the oral and the anal uh, zones. And um, um, I, I think that it would be fair to say that um, the two things that Freud are um, uh, thought of, uh, as, uh, the two things that are thought of as, as Freud's main um, points were the discovery of the laws governing unconscious mental uh, uh, life and the importance, the significance for adult life of childhood or infantile sexuality. With regards to childhood uh, infantile sexuality, one of the things that are relevant uh, specifically for our discussion today is Freud's uh, statement that <clears throat> that there is a universal perverse uh, sexuality in infants, that infants have little bits of all of that, and that little bits of all of those different types of sexual pleasures remain to some degree in many healthy adult individuals, and his statement that normal sexuality or what was considered normal sexuality, what is considered by us normal sexuality, is actually hard to achieve. And in fact, without the pressures of culture that represses those aspects which we don't approve of, many more persons would be perverse. So that brings us obviously to the discussion of the role of culture, and uh, I would like to uh, um, uh, mentioned something that uh, Esther, uh, Ethel Pearson um, uh, says. Uh, she says, not only lived experience, our own lived experience, but also that which we are exposed to culturally shapes our psychic lives, shapes our desires, shapes our fantasies, reframing them and giving permission giving a, a, a voice and an image to that which before might have remained or might, might have been pre-conscious material, material that we were not aware of, but becomes um, something that is much more explicit with these contents that culture um, offers us. In recent years, obviously, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, and uh, many other um, uh, processes, social processes, widened by a lot the range of what is acceptable behavior, what is acceptable desires, what are acceptable fantasies in um, American culture, in Western culture, while at the same time we see very different and opposite directions in uh, the culture in other parts of the world. For example, um, let, me, uh, let me mention to you, I'll, it's a little farther, so I'll be 
jumping over there once in a while to show some pictures, but for example, I think it was about a year ago that the president of Iran spoke at Columbia University where uh, I, was, uh, I, I went to uh, listen. My husband teaches there. It was fairly uh, uh, important, I think, to, to be there. And he stated that there are no homosexuals in Iran. And uh, if that is the treatment of uh, certain behavior, then perhaps it is uh, understandable why certain behaviors are suppressed and are not included in the type of desires, fantasies, and behaviors that the culture uh, allows people to exercise. Um, let me go to a slightly... Our own, my own, your own Israeli uh, society, which used to be pretty macho and fairly um, homogenic, homogenous, uh, pride gay um, um, day in Tel Aviv, um, much, much different from what was uh, 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 sort of encouraged or, or uh, the openness that was to it. Uh, even when I was growing up, uh, you know, Tomorrow is my birthday, it's not nice to say, but like 30 years ago or so, it was very different. It's changing. One could say, of course, with regards to the whole issue of, um, you know, what the culture uh, makes possible as, you know, as, you know, bringing out uh, desires from perhaps where they were pre-conscious and we were unaware of them to a level where we can uh, allow ourselves to acknowledge them and sometimes even act on them, one can have very, very different opinions about whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. One just needs to be aware of the fact that this is the mechanism by which some of these things occur. Um, I wanted to show you also some of the changes that occurred here very briefly in American society. So, modern issues that are associated with uh, sexuality, some of which we'll touch upon today, I'm sure, include gender roles, sexual orientation, pornography, uh, rape, incest, sexual functioning and dysfunction, um, child and adolescent sexual behavior, what is appropriate, what is not, what are boundary crossings, and the impact of uh, changing sexual practices on the family. That was just to give a slight uh, sense of how culturally saturated, socially saturated the concepts are that we are talking about. So let me just go into what is, uh, what is our idea of normative or problematic sexual behavior in children. Um, the whole topic, by the way, was kind of taboo until the 80s not only in society, but also in uh, professional um, um, context, conferences and so forth. Most of the articles, most of the research about this is only from the 80s and on. Uh, there was uh, some kind of a myth, uh, a social convenient myth, that um, strangers are the ones primarily abusing children and uh, in reality, sexual abuse uh, referrals um, documented show that um, most children are abused by someone that they know. A babysitter, a friend, a neighbor, 
uh, even a sibling, as was mentioned before, and the idea that uh, children do not uh, perpetrate sexual uh, offenses on others is uh, no longer a tenable myth, actually. Our awareness to, let me show you, while I'm talking, let me show you some um, um, charts. I apologize for the fact that my technical limitations, which are pretty severe, did not allow me to include a title on the, um, on the tables that I copied from my resources, but I will just say what my resources are, if you will allow me. Let me see something else. This is it. For example, from a 2009 report uh, by uh, the American uh, Pediatric Association, if you look at this, there are a, B, and C are columns that indicate uh, less common behaviors, uncommon behaviors in normal children, and rarely normal behaviors. You can look at this uh, perhaps while I'm talking. Uh, did I want to maybe call your attention to something in particular there? Again, due to uh, technical limitations, if anybody wants resources from me, Put your email here, and, uh, uh, or, or take mine, which is on the top, and I will email you whatever you want. Can you check it I'm sorry? Can you yes, I will also write it so you all get to see it when you put yours on, if you request materials. Okay. Our awareness to both sexual abuse and uh, sexual abuse by children has increased uh, dramatically over the last few decades. Um, it is not, uh, it's, it's possibly due to various factors. It's due to the fact that we are much more aware of it. It's due to the possibility we don't know and have no way of knowing that it is increasing because of greater exposure to all kinds of things that children were not exposed to in the past. It is uh, also possible that, um, uh, well, I think primarily we would, we would probably uh, think that it's due to these things. Most children will be involved in some degree of sexual behavior uh, and that would be part of normal childhood behavior. That would be something that we expect, and um, that is something that we will get a little bit more into detail in a minute. I just wanted to give you, though, some of the, uh, some of the statistics about uh, abuse by children, just to sort of uh, um, give, a, give a framework. 20% uh, uh, at least and some people say much more, of all sexual offenses involve adolescent offenders. 30 to 50 percent of child abuse are by uh, youth under 18. Youth under 18 years old accounted for 18 percent of the arrests for forcible rape and other sexual offenses in 2007, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. And similar figures are reported by Australian and uh, English uh, studies and, and reports. Um, studies of adults' offenders reveal that their uh, coercive behavior started often at a very early age and that the number of their violent offenses and the seriousness of that increased with age. That is not to say that every child who uh, behaves uh, even violently uh, sexually as a child will become an adult sex offender, but it certainly speaks to the fact that it is a problem that has to be addressed and that it does not go away by itself and the thought that children will just grow out of it is not supported by research. On the other hand, overreacting to children's uh, sexual behavior, which are perhaps not uh, outside the range of normative behavior is also very possibly uh, uh, negative, will have negative influences on the children, as was mentioned before, and will lead to very punitive, very self-blaming, and, and, and very intense guilt feelings. 
uh, that is also something that is not healthy and that we do, lo- do not want to do. I think that what is very, very important for us as adults working with children and adolescents to remember is, again, the cultural, social, and personal flavoring of our own attitudes to the matter, as was stressed before. Uh, What we feel is normal, we sometimes assume is normal, but is not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily what would be supported by, you know, studies looking at the actual numbers of what people do. It's mostly something that is implicitly sort of ingrained in our own lived experience, in our parents' attitude, in our culture around us, and so forth. And Just to make a point that I'm hoping to have the time to get a little bit more into at the very end, we have to remember that our attitudes about the most important things in life have both explicit and implicit aspects. Explicit being those things that we are very aware that we think, that we think that this is forbidden, that we think that this is good, and that our culture gives us scripts that are easily and uh, uh, readily available to us consciously. Implicit attitudes are much trickier because they are the ones, as I said before, ingrained in what we think is right or not right. It's the things that we um, absorbed very early, often from a very preverbal age on, in a very preverbal way, from the way our parents avert their gaze or the way they make a little <clears throat> when we say something that's not right. It's those things that become symbols to uh, what doesn't work well for us in relationships. First of all, my mother doesn't like when I do that. She turns away from me. She, uh, her touch becomes a lot less soft and cuddly. Those are signs that show an infant and a little child that this behavior is unacceptable. And this, of course, continues in different ways throughout life. Parents don't usually change their attitudes dramatically, so it continues in different ways at different ages. And it becomes something that also reinforces within us the feeling of what aspects of ourselves are acceptable to us and what aspects we should delete and edit out, not just from our uh, uh, relationship with other people, but also in many ways from the way that we see, excuse me, ourselves. I'll just get the the glass of water with your permission. Okay. Okay, so what we need to understand when we see children who behave in ways that are clearly disturbing to us and not the way we would like to see children behave, is that we have to re-examine our own attitudes in order to be able to do the right thing, in order to be able to assess where exactly the child is, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, what is the nature of the boundary crossing that we're looking at. We have to somehow be aware of our own explicit and implicit uh, attitudes. Part of the way to address it, especially the explicit part of it, is to gain uh, factual knowledge. So let me show you another chart. This, for example, this chart is taken from the Mayo Clinic study, and it shows behaviors that are uh, uh, that were seen in a large sample of children. This is, I believe, my first chart is for the male. You see? Male children. And I have another one for females. Please take a moment to look at it. It's a long chart, so let me point out a few things to you. For example, item number two stands too close. Uh, You know, just the second item on the list, and just think about how incredibly culture dependent that is. Let me tell you something. I come from a nice Ashkenazi family in Israel. We hug each other tight, full body contact, no problem, you know, big kind of hugs that are very meaningful. 
if I were to hug one of my American friends in this way, it would be inappropriate. So just uh, keep that in mind, that children come from different cultural contexts, children come from different families. Touches sex parts in public, uncomfortable, we don't like when children do that. However, look, 26.5% of children up to age five do that, and it uh, uh, subsides with age. Look at uh, touches breasts, masturbates with hands, these are important aspects that can be very uncomfortable when the child does that uh, habitually, repeatedly. However, we may be personally uh, really thrown off by it. It's important to look at the numbers to sort of realign us with uh, the realities. Again, uh, this, with regards to our explicit attitudes to the matter, it's very important that we have some data. What, what we're going to be talking Hayom, uh, Hayom, Hebrew gets in the way sometimes. What we're going to be talking about today, I would like to refer to as a sexual behavior problem in children because that's the widest term to describe an entire range of behaviors which are indeed very varied. It's a very wide range that uh, differs in the degree of um, severity, in the degree of deviance from normative uh, concepts of what's appropriate for a certain age and a certain developmental level, and also in their degree of potential harm to other children. Some features of, uh, of these behaviors are common, but I would like to stress one thing very much. There are essentially no research supported, empirically supported, common characteristics of the sexually, um, um, uh, uh, of the child with sexual behavior problems. There is no a profile that identifies it. It is not a singular syndrome that we can identify. It is a uh, constellation that can come to be because of a various uh, group of factors that seem to support it. Um, therefore, again, very important to remember, every assessment of every child and every uh, decision about intervention plans has to be done very carefully on a case-to-case -case basis because we have to remember how varied this population is. It is not a single syndrome. Every child is different. The ecological view of it, what is happening around the child, as the speaker before me said, is very, very important. And one other thing that is very important to remember, unlike treatment of the adult sexual offender, we have to remember that children are very amenable to change and that when things change in their environment, they can change too, much more rapidly than the adult offender. So any kind of intervention has to be very time limited, has to be evaluated within a short time, recognizing that children change and change rapidly. Okay, um, let me uh, go on to, um, to show you just to, uh, uh, no, I actually didn't make a slide of it, but I wanted to tell you when speaking of the fact that there are no specific um, profiles that identify children with sexual behaviors, we do think that there are a lot of factors that contribute to that. Some of these factors have to do with exposure to uh, highly sexualized material, whether it's behaviors in the home, whether it's poor boundaries in a family that looks like a normative family, or whether it's a family that is different in its structure and its life than a normative family, like some of the families that we see uh, I don't know if you see, but I, having worked at Yale on the adolescent unit or in emergency psychiatric care in New Jersey, you see children who come from families who are, that have very little to do with our concept of what a family is like. These are families that are, you know, it's a mother 
and a child, the child born to a 16-year-old, 17-year-old out of wedlock. Then she gets on uh, welfare, and uh, then the, the father is not really part of the picture, or very quickly is not. Another guy comes into the picture. Um, that uh, person is uh, more or less functional, has better or poorer boundaries with regards to many issues, including sexual behavior and the behavior towards the child. There is a serial sort of movement in that way in the family of sexual partners. Uh, these are very different families. However, I would like to emphasize what I said before. Poor sexual boundaries or poor boundaries, period, can also be part of the functioning in what we assume to be a normative family. And that has to do with exposure to media, inappropriate media, poor boundaries on Internet access, on TV shows, on uh, how the parents themselves behave in the house. Yeah? Right, I, I was going to say that, you know, this, yeah, not only this is normal, but this is cool. Now, I don't know uh, how many of you have had a chance to hear about this program. Did you hear about it? It's a program that was, uh, yes, it is, yeah, 15-year-olds, yeah. It's a program that describes adolescents' uh, behavior, in, uh, in a very, very um, uh, graphic and extreme way. It was uh, described by the Parent Television Council as the most dangerous show that has been hoisted on your children so far. This is what they said about this program. Well, yes. Now, some vendors have been good enough to ban it from their... Uh, you know, places like Taco Bell and uh, I think a couple of other people joined. But this is part of what is now uh, on some level not only available, and this is not just what our children are exposed to, this is what is in a way cool. Yes. And, uh, and that is something that we have to remember when we are looking and assessing uh, the children that we see, what have they seen, what are they, uh, what are they used to, what is normative for them, what might be part of those factors contributing to their highly sexualized behavior. Yes? Yes, and uh, I think that actually, you know, one could debate that, and we could talk a little bit more about it perhaps if we have more time. Friends is definitely very different from Skins, but... But, yes, but uh, first of all, to begin with, these people are in their late 20s and 30s, and they're not 15-year-olds, first of all, which is a big distinction. However, it's full of sexual innuendos and all kinds of things like that. I have to tell you that personally, I forbade my children from watching these things until a very late point. However, given that they go to a public school, my children became slightly... Um, how shall I say it? Gufzar, you know? They were like different from everybody else. They were out of it. They didn't know what was going on, what was part of the culture. It was very obvious. Anyway, um, let me talk about uh, some attempts to sort of order the phenomenon of uh, children's sexual behavior. Uh, one of the people who tried to do that is somebody who's been uh, a long time in the field. Her name is uh, Tony. Uh, Johnson, she suggested that the continuum of sexual behaviors in children can be divided to four groups. One is the natural and healthy sexual e exploration of children, and I think when we talk about health, uh, you know, sexual exploration and normal, you can try to remember some of these figures, some of these uh, behaviors. It doesn't mean that it's something that we necessarily feel so comfortable with, but we have to understand that that is part of normal and natural exploration. The other group, the second group, is children who uh, she calls are sexually, as she puts it, are sexually reactive. These are children who have, who are uh, reacting to some uh, unusual degree of sexual stimulation that occurred usually within the last 
six to eight weeks in their lives. Not necessarily. Sometimes it's older. Sometimes children have been um, sitting, laying low and not acting out despite sexual um, uh, stimulation and even abuse uh, for a long time, and then the behavior comes out. But usually it's more frequent than that. And uh, the third group is children who mutually engage in a full range of adult sexual behaviors. Um, this is sometimes uh, touches upon the point that uh, Mr. David Mendel made before, uh, you know, the issue of mutuality. We, we will talk a little bit more about that. But here, I'm not talking just about mutuality, which can be part of what happens to the children in the first group, yeah? Children of the same age, children with no great discrepancy in developmental abilities, there is no power issue, but... Uh, a mutual consent, the kind that is very well captured by the statement, show me yours, if I'll show you mine if you show me yours. It's an equal kind of, we're both curious, we're very um, equal, we want to do it together, and we're okay with that. Uh, in the third group, we are actually talking about mutual consent, but children doing, by mutual consent, things that we would consider much, much too advanced for their developmental age in terms of a much fuller range of adult sexual behaviors. And the most severe group is the fourth group, which involves children who molest other children. Uh, some of the things that we would like to stress in any kind of an initial assessment is, uh, first of all, we would like to look at an evaluation of the number and the types of sexual behaviors that this child was involved in. We would like to also know, not about the car, just the current uh, problem that brought this child to our attention, but the history of the child's sexual behaviors. We would like to know whether the child engages in sexual behaviors that are solitary and inappropriate, such as excessive masturbation, or whether they uh, do things with other children. We would like to be able to understand the motivations for these behaviors, the way the child experiences it. We would also like very much to establish, based on our assessment, not only our interview with the child, but our interview with caretakers, what are the circumstances in which these behaviors tend to occur and what are the, which are the circumstances in which these behaviors tend to be under control, namely not occur? What might be the triggering events, feelings uh, that occur just before the child does that? For that, we probably need to uh, not only look at the data that is in front of us from previous reco records, previous reports. We don't only ask parents about what they know. We sometimes need to ask the caretakers and the child to think about that and write it down for a period of time to be looked at uh, a week or two or whatever period of time after the initial interview. We also want to know very much whether there's any form of coercion involved in these behaviors, uh, any kind of bribery, trickery, threats, uh, physical or emotional um, pressure applied on the child to do, uh, on the other child to do whatever uh, they did together. Um, we also need to make sure that we uh, ha run a thorough assessment of the child's home environment, current and past, to make sure that there was no possibility of sexual inappropriate behavior or sexual abuse because we do see a very strong link between past sexual abuse of children and sexual abuse by the same children, although this is a point to remember, clinicians, while there is a strong association between sexualized behaviors in a child and a past history of sexual abuse of that child, sexualized behaviors in the child are not sufficient to assume 
that there was sexual abuse. It's very, very important to remember because we do sometimes tend to jump to conclusions and that can be terrible. On the other hand, I would like to see if I brought something to show you. Yes, on the other hand, if you keep in mind the four groups that I just described to you, uh, I don't know if you um, heard uh, a while ago, it was I think um, maybe two years ago, there was a terrible case in Ramat Sharon of a group of adolescents that severely abused and raped a girl for a duration of three years. In a group, gang way, in, in, in various, various ways for a very long time. And I would like to here, I'll, I'll just read to you a little bit from what it said in the, in the paper. Police say the young woman's, woman's abuse began at age 15 with a simple love affair between herself and a boy her age. Okay, what's more normal than that, right? who later took advantage of her feelings for him to force her to have sexual relations with his friends, at times with several of them present. She said she had been beaten, I'm skipping stuff, she had been beaten and humiliated by the suspects and that they had thrown bags of water at her. Police also suspect that some of the videos showing the girl being raped by the suspects can be seen online. That, by the way, is a facet, new facet of sexual victimization, which has been added fairly recently to the repertory, this thing of putting sexual uh, videos online, and as uh, we all know, it had led to some very tragic consequences recently in this country with, uh, with kids killing themselves because they couldn't tolerate this aspect of the victimization. Uh, what is very interesting and I want to uh, read to you is the parents of the abusing uh, suspects. Some, uh, by the way, one point to be made, this is an affluent a uh, nice environment from which these kids came, just to strengthen or emphasize the point that environmental violence, abuse, uh, lack of uh, family um, uh, uh, structure is not, is not the only uh, way in which children come to be sexual abusers. There are apparently many pathways to come to this some involve past sexual abuse, some involve environmentally very challenging uh, circumstances, and some are other ways to come by it. Um, many of this, uh, right, that's, uh, that's a point I wanted to make to you. And what the parents said, I don't know if I have it here, perhaps I didn't bring it, but yeah, uh, the parents said, Today everything is rape, everything is criminal, said the father of one of the youth. A girl is raped for three years but doesn't say a word. Everyone should look at the photos that she herself placed online and see how provocative the girl is. Right? Well, we do know that children have suffered abuse from parents, older, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, supervisors, teachers, babysitters, uh, many times for long periods of times and haven't said a word. Of course, the same can happen with a peer. And again, what it does bring out is the difficulty sometimes for the victim to come up and say it. And even to be fair, it's difficult sometimes, although this is really terrible to hear when we know how badly the girl was abused, I can tell you that sometimes it is not totally easy to distinguish whether there was mutual consent and to which degree uh, it changed into an abusive, victimizing relationship because victimizing children seek out children who are vulnerable to it, children who are vulnerable socially, psychologically, emotionally to this kind of abuse and many times the vulnerability is such that the child will actually 
do or consent to do or be drawn to do something because they're so socially isolated, they're so emotionally needy that it may appear as behavior that began voluntarily, at least began voluntarily and by mutual consent. If there are no big age differences, it may be misleading. However, things can get out of hand, like in this case, very often. Okay. Um, let me, uh, shall we say a little bit more about each of the groups and what characterizes them? I think that would be perhaps a good idea. So let's talk about the first group, natural uh, uh, healthy sexual play. Oh, and let me put my watch in front of me. So children explore their bodies. Uh, very typical ways by which it happens is playing doctor or playing house. This is a natural kind of way to explore both gender roles and uh, uh, their own and other uh, children's bodies. The typical features for this type of play is that it occurs between children are of, who are of the same age and developmental level, because, you know, developmental level might mean that some child is six and the other one is ten, but if the ten-year-old is intellectually challenged, then there is a developmental discrepancy. But Normal explorative play occurs between equals, equals in size, age, and developmental level who participate voluntarily. Uh, when caught, and that is another very important feature to remember, when we assess a child's behavior, we have to look also at whether it happened before and how did they respond to having been caught. What was their reaction to adults trying to tell them that this shouldn't happen again? Children in the first group, while they feel kind of the uh, the affect around what they did can be a little bit kind of secretive. They know they're doing something they won't do right in front of you in your living room. At the same time, they're not fearful and anxious and driven. It's just another thing that they do. It doesn't be, it's not a preoccupation and it's not laden with very intense affect. It's, it's usually lay sort of in the context of a very giggly, giddy, excited, slightly uh, guilty affect around it. And when caught and told that this is inappropriate and they should stop it, children usually respond and stop it. They get the idea that this is something we don't do in public. By the way, in response to the uh, question before, uh, I think that how to respond to children's sexual behavior, inappropriate behavior, whether it's masturbation or something else, you know, in normative uh, uh, cases, we say very concrete things. We tell them what are our rules for acceptable behavior. We don't do that. Yeah, and we need to be very concrete. We don't touch our private parts in public. And you have to think about it. What do you want to say? You don't want to say perhaps what I just said initially. Uh, we don't do this or we don't do it. Because what is it? We don't do it at all. We don't have sex at all. We think that all of it is bad or we don't do this in particular or we don't do this in particular in public. We can do it in private. Think about what it is that we want to say. However, normative play, there is a good response to, ch to adult uh, direction. And what we do is we simply reinforce it like we reinforce any behavior and we uh, hope that by uh, uh, showing the child positive consequences of behaving like we want them to and sometimes uh, mild negative consequences for when they do something which we don't think they should do, we shape their behavior like any other type of behavior shaping. Uh, the group, the second group that, uh, in, that is involved in extensive mutual sexual behavior have a much more... Uh, focused, pervasive uh, preoccupation with sexual activities and sexual contents, and they are less responsive to adult directions to stop it. They participate in a much wider spectrum of adult sexual behaviors, which can include um, even uh, as much as uh, anal and oral intercourse, 
they usually are of the same age level and developmental level, and they conspire together to keep the behavior secret. It's not a power relationship. It is not a victimizer-victim relationship. It is a mutual conspiracy to do this thing which we're not supposed to do, which we're really, really focused on doing, and keeping it secret together. While there might be some degree of mutual persuasion, there is no coercion or use of, uh, of physical or emotional uh, pressure. And uh, one of the things that Tony, that Tony Johnson uh, feels characterizes the second group is actually their lack of affect around sexual behavior. They are not at all excited about it. There is no light-hearted excitement and giddiness like in the first group of sexual exploration. And there is also not what I will say in a minute about the next group, the fourth group, the molesters. There is no anger and aggression. There is just a kind of a blasé, that's what we do, that's how we play. Kind of the way that they relate to their peers is sexual, is highly sexualized, but it 